as our coverage of the 2022 World Games Flying Disc Competition continues on this overcast and steamy Tuesday in the state of Alabama here in the United States. Getting set for game two of the day as Australia and France meet to continue our competition. Evan Lepler, Megan Tormey, Daryl Stanley getting ready for Tom Stiles and Rahel Toshnerova to call the action from the Olympic Channel in Madrid. We just watched Canada fall to Germany 13-5 at the start of the day. An incredible effort from Germany. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, Australia and France. It's the Australians' fifth World Game appearance. Their previous four trips, they've won three medals, two silvers and a bronze. Megan, the French are playing in the World Games for the first time, a byproduct of the field expanding from six countries to eight countries. So. The French trying to make some history here today. Yeah, it's you know one of those moments that everyone will remember for their program the first time France appeared at the World Games. And you know that they are excited, but as we witnessed in the previous game, the nerves are real. And so France comes at a deficit not having been on this stage before and experienced this kind of moment. Well, luckily they're in Pool B and they can uh, look forward to not necessarily having to face Germany. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, they get to set their own stage. I think that's going to be very exciting for them. But that experience is, is vital. Um, they'll learn quick, though. I mean, Australia is going to really put them to the test. The Crocs, as the Aussies call themselves, are led by Anna Rogacki, an experienced coach. And nine years ago in Cali, Colombia, the Australians were in the final against Team USA in a game that was relatively one-sided. But uh, the Americans, led by Bo Kittredge in his heyday, Taking care of business. Kara Crouch is fantastic for Opie that Payne. American team. Opie Payne is back. Yes. We'll see her with the USA team later today. Uh, what are the trademarks of Australian Ultimate, Daryl, when you faced them in the U24 level? Verticality. Lots of uh, tall athletes, lots of big throws. Um, they ran really, really hard against us and, and were just extremely, extremely deep with their throws. I, I, I found that if we took that away from them, it made the game a little bit easier for us to handle because if we didn't, I mean, they, they would score two packs every time. Well, it was 13 to 6 in the final USA over Australia. Cat Phillips is back for more. Unquestionably, one of the international stars of the sport, a professional Aussie rules football player in her home country, but ultimate has been her first and biggest love. And uh, Megan, I mean, we saw Lefko Volchek leave her finger marks all over that first game. Would expect Kat Phillips to come out in a similar way. Absolutely. She's an individual who is perfectly capable, ready, and willing to take over a game when necessary. And it's so nice to have someone with that athleticism, that experience, who can really help set the tone in a game. It makes you feel very assured that when you step out onto the field, things are going to go well for you. And if while you're kind of getting your bearings, things aren't, a player like Cat Phillips can certainly make sure you're still putting points on the board. Australia also has two other um, players who are familiar with this, playing in America, playing in these kind of stakes. Uh, Tom Tulit, um, you know, he played with uh, Bravo. the Bravo team in 2014, that one. And then uh, Alex Latomatos was on that pony team. Uh, that went the championship in 2018 here in the U.S. So getting that, getting those players here at a tournament like this, I think is is, is vital. The, the Crocs, as they were saying, yeah. were very fond of sending their players overseas and, and, and into Europe to get other experiences and to try to bring that back. Um, they said it was invaluable to setting the tone. So, Well, some of the French males have North American experience as well, playing in the AUDL with the Montreal Royale. And look, the French women's scene has come on strong in Europe. Yaka contending for European championships. So it's going to be very interesting to see if they can match up with the Aussies' experience. And I was going to say depth, but it's 14 on 14. Does depth matter at this tournament? Not at all. No, it's about who can, who's playing really well right, right now. Yeah, absolutely. If there's someone who's not playing well on your squad, there's no place for them to hide. None. No, you have to play two lines, you're going to play again. Well, let's talk about the domination from Team Germany as we check out the weather here in Birmingham. It is hot, but thankfully for the moment, it is cloudy. Is it really only 79 degrees Fahrenheit? <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Me too. 
It's that lack of wind. I mean, I, I'd love for a little bit of wind right now. A little. There was breeze last night when we were here at the field getting ready, but uh, no wind has been a factor so far. L let's go back to Germany, Canada, for those who joined us late, maybe didn't see it. The Germans jumped out to a 4 nothing start, a patient offensive hold, and then three consecutive breaks, and it was 8-5 in the second half before Germany closed 5 to nothing. I ask you, how big of a threat to the United States tomorrow are the Germans? Well, they certainly are a threat. There's no doubt about it. If you watch that film, even a little bit of it, you'll recognize that there is definitely a threat. The issue in this particular game that led to the deficit is simply how poorly Canada played against them. And they didn't, besides Britt DeSantos, they did not have anyone step up and make the kinds of plays that was necessary to notch any sort of advantage against the Germans. You have to think with a little more throwing power on the U.S. line, they might be able to stay just a little bit farther ahead of the crushing German defense that we saw today. Uh, but, but it is definitely something that has put the U.S. on notice for sure. Yeah, if the U.S. thought that Canada was going to be their, their biggest threat, I mean, Germany said, nope. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be <laughs> us right now. Give us that frisbee. We're not giving it back. So. We haven't seen the United States play yet other than matchups with Canada at poultry days, which was a very different feel. Both teams were camping outside and drinking the night before. This is a very different level of serious competition. But, Daryl, after watching Germany and knowing the personnel on the United States, any advantages for Germany personnel-wise based upon what you saw today? It's an interesting question. I mean... I'll be curious to see the matchups because, like, I I think that Priend, she uh, she is going to represent a challenge. I mean, Claire Troop is probably somebody I would expect to guard her, but I mean, she could really look like she can go off. Um, on the men's side, Nico Mueller is used to playing against yeah. these players. Um, so, so is Conrad Schlor. So is Conrad. So I, I think they're not going to be awed by the moment. I'd like to see how the rest of the team goes uh, against the the U.S. Well, we'll see. And the they didn't look they didn't look remotely concerned about no. the moment. You know. A guy that's been considered Germany's one of their top players and maybe the top leader, Holger Beutzenmüller, was removed from this roster shortly before the event because of a meniscus injury. He was coming back from an ACL, thought he was all the way back, but felt some swelling in his knee a couple months ago, and they took him off the roster. His uh, younger brother, Sammy Beutzenmüller, is playing well, and Holger insists that Sammy is the better Beutzenmüller <sighs> of the three Beutzenmüller boys. But uh, goodness, Germany with a dominant first performance. We will see what happens here in game two as we get ready for Australia and France. What's your pick? Listen, uh, I'm going to go with Australia, but listen, fans, Kenton Roger, look out for him. He is ambidextrous. You're not seeing things. Uh, he can throw with both uh, his lefty and his righty. He's really good. On for Team France. I'm also picking Australia, and I am fine being wrong as I was last round if France comes out with an absolutely spectacular performance the way that Germany did in the previous round. That is totally fine by me. Well... Only one of us here took the Germans last time, and I am not going to go with the other European team. I am also going to take Australia. I think uh, Anna Regracki's Crocs start off with a win here in Birmingham. Tom Stiles and Rahel Toshnerova will have the call for you from the Olympic Channel Studios in Madrid. We will see you at halftime. Every four years, there is a new opportunity. A chance for the world's best players to take center stage. A chance for glory, for teamwork, for upsets, for gold. Eight countries are sending their 14 finest to Birmingham, Alabama for the opportunity to reach the pinnacle of ultimate. The 2022 World Games start right now.
Uh, the World Games Flying Disc Competition is underway in Alabama. The seven best men and best women from the eight strongest ultimate nations gather in the heat and humidity of Birmingham. It's the second game of the tournament and the first game of Pool B as Australia play France. I'm Tom Stiles alongside Raquel Toshnerova. And Raquel, we've got two teams here that which have got a lot of promise, Australia. But let's talk about France first. Let me tell you, Tom, this is a big deal for France. This is their first time sending a team to represent their country at the Flying Disc Competition. They have started their preparation back in 2021 to end up with this final roster of 14 players. Um, Aline Mondiot, the former Eurostar and a stellar support for many French national teams, as well as her home club, Yaka. She's been huge in Europe, but can she assert herself against international competition as well? Yeah, Mondio, one of those incredible throwers, but the Australian defense is going to be a big challenge for her. That's right. Uh, we, I am a big fan of Ultimate Sisters, and we will see quite a few this week. So starting with the Phillips Sisters, obviously, we can expect Kat to move around the disc quite a bit, and Mish, I think, will find herself more downfield, and she might be lethal in the end zone for the Australians. Yeah, Cat Phillips and Mish Phillips in the 35 shirt and 17 shirt. Very tall, very athletic. Um, I think Cat Phillips, one of the standout players uh, for Australia in the last two World, Go World Game cycles. Uh, great to see her back on the field. And can she make the huge impact that we know she's capable of? There is a little bit more experience now on this Australian team. They have been to the World Games. This is their. This is uh, Australia's fifth appearance to the World Games, and we have a lot of players on the Australian team that have already been Crocs, as they like to call themselves, because the Australians do have a name of a native animal to each of their national teams. So the World Games teams being the Crocs. And just to keep us on our toes, the Australians featuring four players with the name of Alex. Uh, so Alex Prentice and Alex Ganna, you saw in the shot just there, Alex Ladamatos and Alex Shepard as well. And we're expecting to see a Shepard. He's got the potential to score big, hasn't he? He does, but I have actually had a little bird tell me that Alex Gann looked like the best player on the field at this year's Australian Nationals. Well, we have to keep an eye out for Alex Gann. We see Nazem Bay, one of the coaching staff for Team France. Very experienced player, very popular player on, in the European uh, scene. Just won the Masters Mixed Clubs in Limerick. So he keeps competing himself at the world stage. Knows very well what it's like to be up there among the best, feeling the pressure. But the question, of course, remains, will he be able to transfer that experience to this young French team? So Australia in yellow, France in white. France are going to start on offense. The Australians will pull them the disc and uh, mixed gender will be swapping gender ratios between four women and three men and then back to uh, four men and three women. We're starting with uh, four men and three women, which means a man is going to pull. And our game advisor will be introducing the disc into the first game. To get this uh, game under the way, the teams have trained hard. They've traveled the world. They are in Alabama. And all that build-up, all that preparation comes down to this. Some running, some throwing, and a piece of flying plastic. The World Games pitches look in immaculate down in Birmingham, Alabama, as this first pull goes up. Pull B underway. Flying high. Back of the end zone. Is it going to drift out of bounds? It does. And a disc that goes out of bounds from the pole will be brought forward to the brick mark. It's a 15-yard advantage. I don't think the Australians wanted to give up that many yards off the bat. I think they just, slightly, they just got slightly overexcited on that first big throw. Quentin Roger brings the disc forward for France. A lot of pressure on the mark, but managing to get the disc forward. Quickly to Becker, down the line again, Roger continues the cut. Good movement from the French, a big pressure bid on that. It's just the uh, French still with the disc now. Roger into the far corner. Oh, it's a classy disc to Sasha Poat Skolski. 
And it's a clean hold for the French, opening their account nicely in this game. So no women involved in that last point. But whatever works for the French, they're only settling in on the international stage. And this is an important hold of always so much pressure on that first offensive point. It's a really interesting point you raise, Egg. I spotted that as well. No, it was all men involved in handling and in the reception. Is that perhaps because the Australian women are so strong? Could be, but then again, it's not necessarily anything wrong. It just can work out that way. It also means that the women were doing a good job of making space for the right cuts. Opening, We saw a lot of space in the break side where the final score eventually went. So not necessarily a bad thing, but it remains a question whether it becomes a trend in the game or we will see more involvement for the women. Well, we will get some straight away by Pauline Berthet with the poll for friends. Berthet, and uh, we've now got four women on the field, three men, so a woman is pulling, and that pull is not a good pull. Really, <laughs> that's not made it to halfway, and it's gone out the side of the field. So we taken from the side, as we see Tom Tulip march over and uh, bring that disc into play. Tulip, huge um, CV of ultimate from around the world. Goes by the nickname of Cupcake in Australian Ultimate. Tulip, swinging out to the far side. Phillips coming under. Gets it back to Tulip again. Good uh, poach off D there by the French Florence Capelle. Tulip back in the backfield. Big poachy defensive look from the French here. Again, uh, oh, that's the Skolski uh, marking away from the player, but it's a big disc and it's cupcake on the end of it. Tom Tulip scores and two clean holds for our teams as they level it up at one apiece. I thought that was really either a really good job by France or sort of a slow, patient start for Australia. Not too many cuts from um, see, that we're seeing downfield. Here was the little shoulder fake that eventually got Tulip free in the end zone. But on the other hand, I thought the French match D wasn't bad at all. Interesting, they had a lot of uh, players just poach off into the spaces, not necessarily marking so tight one-to-one. -one. Is that a tactic we're going to see from them so far? It was uh, Andrews with the assist. Rob Andrews, 25 shirt, back playing for uh, Australia at the World Games for the Aussie Crocs. Beautiful grass in Alabama, in Birmingham, for the Flying Disc Ultimate. Cairo Ma with the pole for Australia. We're sticking with four women on the line. Oh, sends it downfield. Well balanced and a quick disc. Oh, nearly chased down, nearly fingertip turnover. Great pace from Kyle O, a real speedster, come through the junior ranks in Australia, known for his fast cuts, but he almost got a fingertip to that. The French relieved to see he hasn't. Another poachy look from the Australians now. They have fallen back into one-on-one -on -one coverage. Now, in the backfield, the French, Robley. to that far side, Le Robles continues the cut up the line. He's going to continue the pass, flowing into the end zone. It's well read, but oh, he just couldn't quite get there. The legs ran out. Poat Sokolski sees it dive into the turf. Frustration from the French. So we saw a little bit of one of the first tactical moves from Australia in that last possession, where they tried to do a little bit of poachy D. Also, I, I believe we saw a mismatch on a gender mismatch on one of the couples on the field and it worked out it brought the turnover it's in the air. 
So a pit call on the field stops the play. And as I was saying, Australia was pretty big also in Wroclaw um, at the last World Games, where they brought in some really interesting defensive looks, really using the full spectrum of possibilities in mixed ultimate. Adamatos on the far sideline gets it back. Andrews, Andrews returns the disc again. Kyle O available on the reset, but been heavily marked by Gail Ancelin, the French captain. Oh, there's a bit of contact on the throw there, but it's uh, still come up in Australian hands. Big shot deep, chance for a break here. And Australians have got it. So that is Andrews with the score. Excellent stuff out of the Australians, very easy very clean offensive offensive uh possession there by the australians i believe the french were doing quite well against that pochi look ancelan really exuding calmness as he was holding the disc and navigating the traffic sort of showing the players where the open spots are but then on that last throw eventually it was just a bit too far just out of reach and then it seems like the Australians won't hold back and Ma with that deep shot into the end zone. See this uh, point unfold. Here's the big shot deep. Robley overcooking it. You can see the frustration from Florence Capel. She saw it go to ground. That little bit of contact. No hesitation. Carol Ma. And a big uh, reception from Rob Andrews using his height, using his speed to get free deep. Australia coming out of the blocks pretty quickly with their first break of the game. Mondio in the centre of the field just sends the disc out to that wing. Sprints forward. Breaking through the uh, Australian Cup. The Australians have changed back to a one-on-one -on -one defence. Again, Mondio on the far side. Got a reset in the in the centre with Roger. And the throw from Roger is a little bit wayward. Australians with a gifted opportunity. You're correct, Tom, in saying that they do switch to match defence, but they do keep the gender mismatch on the handlers. So hoping to cause sort of some kind of, kind of confusion downfield. And so far it's been working. Yeah, I think this is an Australian tactic. When they switch from zone to one-on-one uh, -on -one coverage. They'll just take whoever's nearest and not bothered about the, the gender matchup. And I think that confuses a lot of players and creates that kind of uh, fluid feeling amongst their opposition. And they're capitalizing in the middle of the field at the moment. Georgia Egan Griffiths getting on the disc. Gets it across to Gant. Egan Griffiths on the sideline. Mondio coming to mark. Big overthrow is going to have to be chased down, but uses the legs. Kyle O using the speed to keep the disc alive for Australia. The Crocs looking really comfortable here, Raquel. Oh, and just as we say that, out of nowhere, a disc that was left in the air a little bit too long is punished. Taken down to the ground by Eva Bonneau, one of the youngest players on this French side. The 19-year-old uh, student flies gets the fingertips to it and gets it back into French hands. She gets the disc now, straight off the first pass. Mondio now with a gainer. Anton Roger. Looking to flow down the line. That's nice work from the two French combining. There was a player free in the end zone. Doesn't take the option. Swings it back again. Being sure about this. Roger. Always free. That's a floaty one. It's going to be taken high. Needed to be taken high as well. Roger has it again. He's going every other at the moment. They're going to run out of energy if he continues doing that. Mondio. Mondio throws are such a weapon, but she needs players deep to throw at. And at the moment, she's not getting them. Oh, that's a beautiful pass. Floated perfectly. Great cut forward from the French. Vincent Pagnol sprints into the end zone. 
Excellent stuff out of the French to get the disc back. It was an important hold for them. They don't want to fall far behind this Australian team. Eva Bornon, of course, with the block. Only 167 centimeters tall, but she's not afraid to put her body on the line. She has, it has been kind of the story of her ultimate career. She's been very athletic. She loves to lay out, uh, just like her sister. So another couple of ultimate sisters on this, for this French side as well. Beautiful replay. Even if she potentially did not get a hand on the disc, it was enough to scare or disturb the catch. That was a great example in that last replay of the throw and go from Vincent Pagnol. The quick dish, but he was already in full stride. See Phillips and Tullet for uh, Australia. Yeah, the, the two uh, young French sisters there, Ava Bonneau and Lison Bonneau, um, with young players, they have this incredible ability to produce highlights, but they lack that experience, that composure. If we can see more incredible action like that uh, from Ava and her sister, then the French can keep themselves fighting in this game. Australian line with a little bit more experience, you'd think. Phillips now. So you expect to see a lot from Phillips. A, a big cross-field pass almost beyond the receiver. Kept alive. Coming back again now. Phillips, just that little drop of the shoulder, sprints free. And a, a trip from Lison Bonneau. Trying to uh, keep Cat Phillips in your pocket isn't an easy job when you are on your feet, but much more difficult. Sat down. So we saw the first set play from the Aussies. Kind of isolating Cat Phillips for the first in cut, but no continuation there really. Now they continue to the far sideline. This is good work from uh, the Australians. Juliet into the front corner. Shepard sprints forward. No complaint from the French. It's an Aussie hold. But they were fighting hard. The French defence on their shoulder the whole way. Great defensive effort at the end by Becca. He laid out on that last quick up line. Almost got a hand on it, but the receiver able to keep his eyes on the disc. Here's Phillips with the slightly errant pass. Yeah, she's going to have to buy Tula a drink uh, in the bar tonight after that one. He really saved her skin. He's no. more of a coffee guy, I hear. Okay. <laughs> Australians can choose a drink of choice, but he definitely owes her one. Uh, and Shepard clearing up that point in the front corner. Just not doing anything complicated at the moment, the Australians. He's doing the simple things right. Cut to the front cone, get the, get the point in. Nothing dramatic, nothing spectacular. Yeah, they're keeping it quite conservative on the, on the offensive side of things so far. On the defense, like we've already pointed out, they do engage in some more advanced defensive tactics in terms of really using the different options that mixed gender ultimate offers. Disc soaring down the field. Mondio gets it started again for France. Roger, quick pass forward to Lapagnon. And a foot block is going to be a complaint here, I think. It's Andrews for Australia. Getting the foot block. Lapagnon says no. I still had the disc in my hand. No complaint. Uncontested. You see the hand signals there. Ultimate entirely self-refereed. There's no officials. Uh, we have the game advisors that are at the side of the field in the green shirt. So here to help the players keep the game moving. We do not make binding calls. Everything else is handled by the players on field. Roger. Very close to uh, keep his feet in the sideline there. And a grab. And it's a takedown from Rob Andrews in the middle of the field. Got ahead of the French uh, French offensive player. Quick dish back. Ladamatos. It's the break inside. And it's a poor disc. And Mondio comes through. Not a good disc downfield. The target was Georgia Egan Griffiths. But the disc was behind her. Not really a usual role for Mondio to get the run through Ds, but she gets one there anyway. Great awareness, and the French get the disc back. Okay, into the end zone. Big shot. 
Big grab. The French have scored it. They had to work hard, but that is a hold for them. And that's gritty from the French. You know, given the, uh, taking the, giving the disc away, but getting it back and fighting hard to do so, they'll be pleased to stay in this game. They, they know they can't let the Aussies get away from them. And Eva Borno adds to her stats a point next to the huge block she got earlier in the game. We said she was going to be big, and she's doing just that. So I don't think, Tom, that too much was expected of this French team. There are different names, young names. Here's the run through D from Mondio again. And in that final point, Fouquet with the shot to the end zone, two women connecting. Great grab from uh, Eva Bonneau. Yeah, that's an interesting point you raise. I think the French come in as eighth seed. They're a nation that's always been established as, you know, the the five to eight bracket at world championships in whatever division they've competed in. They're, they're a, a, a force to be reckoned with in Europe this year. But I think you're right. I think people are seeing them as not the strongest team here. And they've got a chance here to upset the Australians. The Australians looking like, uh, you know, they're a solid side, but n nothing too impressive so far. But I think the good, solid start for the French is going to help them mentally to get through the what could be the first few shaky points. And awesome. here is an yeah. overthrow. Yes, yeah, Sam McGookin throwing it over the head into the sideline. Not a complicated throw there, just a simple flick. Arcing, but... And there's no wind. This, we've got to point out, this is a completely still day. And any anyone down on the sideline is going to be really feeling the heat. Uh, there's no breeze to remove that. But there's also, it doesn't affect the disc at all. I think it was either a miscommunication or Ancelan actually got a little foot on that disc from McGuckin. But nonetheless, French go the other way. Nice inside flick to open up the space, gets it back into the middle of the field. French looking really comfortable. Mondio going backwards and then sends the big arm downfield. There's space in the end zone, chasing it down. Those two French players queue it up to take the disc out of the sky. And Quentin Roger celebrates with the French team. Let's have a look at that replay again. The movement, so good. The French are flying. That is a break to get back on serve here in this opening Pool B matchup. And they are super happy and pumped about that. The Europeans come and streaking in this first game of first day of World Games. I am just absolutely in awe. It, it was a, a great piece of French possession. And into the end zone, you, you don't want to be chasing down a disc in the end zone on your own. If there's another player there, it just gives you that feeling of confidence that well, either of us can take this. And it down. was it was clearly very well communicated because the because uh, Roger was behind the other player. Here's Mondio. Excellent body control to get up and put that up. And that was actually Borneau. Again, Eva Borneau striking for that deep shot. So as we have reached four points on the scoreboard for France, I think we're going to go into what is referred to as a heat break. Yeah, three, three minutes added on to the clock. And this is, uh, you know, something that the WFDF have, have um, thrown in just because the, the players uh, are in su exercising at such an intense level in this incredible heat. They just need a, a few minutes in the shade of the tent with the cold blankets on. So we're having those in addition to a half. So you still get the half when, a, when the first team reaches uh, seven points, uh, but we also get one when the first team reaches four and when... a when a team reaches 10 points. Now, these are only going to happen when the temperature is at a certain level. So we didn't get one in the first game this morning, but now we see the temperature on the screen, 82 Fahrenheit. And as Tom does the little calculation for our European fans, which is very much needed because I honestly have no idea how much 82 degrees Fahrenheit is, uh, let's just quickly talk about the preparation of these teams. We know for sure that the head coach of Australia, Anna Rogaki, places a lot of emphasis on the mental side of things, on the mental side of training, to really bring the team together. So besides tactics, besides physical preparation, which is fairly 
what every every other team will be doing as well. She really focuses on that mental toughness, mental fitness, sense of togetherness, growth of the team type of thing. And I thought this is exactly what maybe France was not ready for as much in a sense that they, you know, had to keep up with all the other parts, be, this being their first time to prepare for such a huge event. First time for the federation, first time for the coaches and all that. So I thought maybe there won't be as much time for the little nuances. They're obviously as important as any of the other aspects, but they they tend to be forgotten once in a while. So, but it, it doesn't really seem like it. <laughs> well, they're playing with a huge smile on their face. I think that's the, the thing that's impressed me about the French so far in this game. It's the joy that they're playing with, you know, running... Uh, through into the end zone with a huge smile on their face, uh, taking down the discs. And the French started on offense and they are back on serve, having got that break back against the strong uh, Australian team. Australian finishing fourth, um, and you know one of the you know one of the strongest teams coming into this tournament. France not seen in the same bracket, but they have arrived and they have uh, come to make an impact. And honestly. Uh, Raquel, this is one of the best things about this World Games tournament. Any team with the best 14 players can come and compete. It's amazing. It is quite a thing when you think about it because it's only so many countries get a shot to participate in a huge tournament and I think they all consider themselves very lucky in the framework of European Ultimate or just World Ultimate in general coming out from different sized communities so they know they're there to represent more than just themselves, just their team and just their country. There are so many players who would love to be there on that pitch competing. So they're really, they have a lot of responsibility towards other people watching them as well. Yeah, the whole nation on their back. We spoke to both, both these teams before. I know they both recognize that. Big disc going downfield doesn't quite hang in the air long enough to make it to the end zone. It's going to be dished back to Kyle O. Oh, looking for a way forward and instead finds that reset back to the ever-present Phillips who jams it into the front corner. Real whip on the backhand from Phillips. Sam McGookin cutting free and a solid offensive hold from Australia. Not messing around that time. McGookin started playing in Brisbane. Uh, but about 2018, he had a big breakthrough when he played for the U24s Australian national team. He eventually moved to Melbourne for family I believe in 2019 then moved again um, to Sydney but has played with a number of big Australian clubs such as Mammoth, Ellipsis, Sunder of course most of these players on for the Australian side coming out of the club Ellipsis but we do have a couple of players from Sunder as well yeah, the uh, Australian side with some mi a real nice mix of youth and experience. Uh, you know, Tom Tulett and Cat Phillips leading that line. And they've got, uh, you know, down to players like uh, Liv Carr, who's, who's only 25. So a real mix. And Alex Gann, who mentioned earlier, 26 years old. So no sort of novices here. And... Uh, Tom Tulip was pleased to say that was nearly got the fingertips to that. Mondio uh, was lucky to have the disc in her hand. The Australian opening pass defence, really strong. French using the full width of the field. Bosser, he cuts through the middle and gets it out to the far side. The Australian zone, loose. Not getting too close to the players, but they're leaving gaps, and that's being exploited by the French so far as the sun comes out in Birmingham. Difficult. Shepard raises an arm. He's watching the player, not the disc, but he almost got a telep telepathic D there, reaching up the big arm. Matteo Bosser gets the flick out. Australians have gone to one-to-one -one now as Mish Phillips marks for Australia across the field. Le Pagnol. And a big bid comes in, and that is the disc in the hands of the Aussies. Huge uh, Sally Yu getting horizontal, getting the touch, and it's completed downfield. 
Great pass forward for second point of the game. Rob Andrews collects. And the Aussies have got another break. It's tit for tat at the moment here. And Australia in the ascendancy after that heat timeout. And it was very quick. Basically, a one-shot pass into the end zone. Gets the Aussies up 5-4 against France. Not um, an unforced mistake out of the French. This really was just a run through D. Not much to say about that. I think it was after Australia transitioned from their poachy, zony, mm. something interesting looking uh, defensive setup. And they really exploited that. So, yeah, Sally Yu with the huge block for Australia. And, and they are looking hungry for the disc, the Australians. Down on a couple of these big pulls. Let's see if they do this again. Caro Ma uh, with two assists in this game. She'll be pulling for this point. Let's see this again. Huge bid. She says. Sally Yu says that her biggest talent is making a very loud, shrill noise with her lips, akin to a whistle, but not a whistle. I would say her best talent, though, is just getting huge on D. Certainly getting the points for Australia. This Pool B matchup, very tight at the moment. France trail by one, trying to work their way up the field, and a pick is called. Pick similar to basketball. If uh, the defensive player is obstructed and can't keep up because of a collision or an obstruction in the middle of the field, they raise their arms in a sort of a muscle man pose, and it's a signal for play to stop, and the disc will generally go back. Coming out of the deep space, Céline Antoine for France. Resets back around to Port Suskolski. On the wing, Antoine again. Those two just exchanging discs. Now they're finding a bit of space through the middle. At the halfway mark, Robley gets the disc back. Compressed field, downfield, nothing coming out of it at the moment. The two handlers. Really good give and go action to actually open up the field for the downfield choices. Hammer really stretching the play, but it's going to be too big. It's over the head, and I think Poat. Uh, Sokolski could have got that if he'd reacted a bit quicker. It was just a bit slow on the was, uptake. I think he was just checking behind to see whether there's any defenders in the space, but there were none, so he really just needed to follow the disc. That is unfortunate. That wasn't a bad option. Would have opened up the break site beautifully for the French, but instead they find themselves on offense with Ladomados. Frustration from the thrower there. It was a good option. It's not been read correctly by the receiver. Blasting the disc across the field. Phillips, sisters combining. Ma and a player down. I think, I think uh, Berthet got a little bump on the mark from Phillips, and it seems like Phillips will uncontest it based on the hand signals we're getting from Berthet. Again, the team's only starting out at the start of the tournament, trying to feel out what the level of physicality will be throughout the tournament. And now we have to wait for the players to get back to their original position at a time when the foul occurred. Bete, back in. That was a big flick from, I think it's Alex Prentice. My apologies, I got confused her with Cat uh, Phillips a minute ago. Andrews. Andrews flicks into the end zone. There's going to be some pressure underneath this, but it's uh, always in the air long enough. Sam Mugukin rises. Uh, it's his second goal of the game. And the Aussies with two breaks now. The French giving the disc away too easily in that point. Are they going to be able to claw their way back into this game? So really only a couple of mistakes to clean up on the French side. The Australians not looking too bothered. I think they were just feeling it out, feeling out the opponent, feeling out the conditions and the field at the start of the game. Now they're really putting on a little bit more pressure. And we'll see the deep shot here. Ancelan sort of knowing that he doesn't have the position nor the angle. I really like the last second effort from Berthe. She's an engineer out of Grenoble, 27 years of age. She has mainly played for 
for her local club, but picked up with Yucca, and uh, she played for the French women's team. I competed against her at the European Ultimate Championship in Dior. Yeah, 6-4. And I tell you what, that uh, heat timeout did the French no favours. They'd scored their offence and got a break going into it. And then since then, they've not uh, not been on the scoreboard. The Aussies scoring the last three points to really turn this game around. And they're down here again, lurking, looking out, out from the centre of the field. The French spread, but no real pressure in the middle as Mondio cuts through and then immediately looks at a whole bunch of yellow shirts, but finds a clever flick, well-weighted. Soaring forward, Mondio again. If you did want somebody in the middle of that handler set to be confident on the disc and have every tool to open up the Australian defence, then Mondio is the person you'd want. Eli Mondio cuts across again and then come, pulls out of that cut. And good job she did. Becker was there. Reset, back around. Fouquet. Into the middle, it's into the end zone. Oh, that was just two French players crossing up over each other. Roger and Lapagnol getting each other's way and they've deed themselves more than anything. The, Fre uh, the Aussies have got the disc back now. The transition to match day really causing these French players some troubles in front of the end zone. Here is Phillips with a huge hook. Chasing it down, is she going to have to bid? Oh, she would have had to bid. That was Liv Carr chasing it. But the uh, disc from Phillips needed a lot more hang give Carr even the slightest chance but the French having worked up against that zone have got to do it all over again now and they looked sapped of energy in this heat so the Aussies decide to stick with match D great camera angle to see those spaces on the field they've gone long can they jump it in they can jump it in and it's a French point and a goal for France Great, ch great chance to see the, where all the spaces were, but the French have got the weapons to open up that space. If you're going to leave exposed at the back, then they, they are going to take the option. That was an incredible full field huck. So French, French are staying tight, which is great, which I believe the one thing that they can take away from the first quarter, shall I say, before the heat time, uh, before the heat break. Well, Here's the two turnovers. It's this disc into the end zone. I think the target was uh, Lapagnol. He was running in, and I think that's where the eyes were. Here's the turnover from Phillips. Nothing wrong with the idea, but the execution just wrong, and you can see the frustration from Phillips. But there's that disc. Roger. Always the throws. So a player taking off from outside the end zone, but it's the first point of contact when they land that matters. That is a great point for the French. But this Aussie defence, Raquel, is causing the French a lot of problems, isn't it? As, so, as long as they're staying in that poachy look, there's always a player open. There's so much space to throw into, and given there's no win, it's, there's nothing hard about that. There's players anyone on the field can throw, throw to that open person. But it's the transition that's been causing trouble and generating turnovers, in fairness. Deep, deep pull, back of the end zone. First pass comes out only to the line. Now it's moving forward. Much more exposed field. Downfield cuts are plenty to throw out here. This is superb flow from the Aussies. Phillips cutting up the line. Tulip running out of uh, options now. Has to throw a huge reset. Phillips cuts again. Big bid coming pressure. Phillips slowed down as she approached that disc and nearly was made to pay for it. Gan into the front corner. One hand at well, disc from Gan was a bit speculative. But uh, Sam McGuckin with his third point for the Aussies. And they've uh, cleanly held. It's 7-5 uh, and it's half time here in Pool B. The Aussie Crocs two up with three breaks to the French single break. We'll be uh, in half. It's 7-5 Australia.
Here in Birmingham, Daryl Stanley, Megan Tormey, Evan Lepler, 7-5. Australia leading France at the half. Three breaks for the Aussies. The French got one back. A big turning point there when they had a chance to take half 7-4. The huck didn't work. The French got one back. But uh, an interesting half. Impressive play by both teams. Pretty clean ultimate, Daryl. No point had more than two turns, and there were five points with zero turns in that first 12-point half. I mean, it's exciting. I, I think we're seeing, even though both these teams are running vertical stack, Australia is bringing a lot more of that verticality we are talking about. They're cutting from the back. Um, six break chances. France has only generated one. Thank goodness they got a break on that. But they're going to really want to find a way to get some more pressure on that, on that vertical uh, Australian attack. Yeah, we're seeing Australia use the full width of the field to their advantage. They're timing their cuts well. France is going to have to make some defensive adjustments if they want to generate more opportunities because Australia just really isn't giving them those opportunities willingly. A couple of turnovers, but they're being pretty pretty reliable with the disc. The game began under the clouds, but the sun has come out and it's up the temperature, but 5, 10, feels like 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Uh, the first half highlights, Australia had the first break. Ma to Andrews. That was one of two goals for Andrews, who also had two assists in that first half and three scores for the big man, number seven, Sam McGuckin. Yeah, he's been he, he's been quite a force. Uh, Andrews, too, has been just impressive. Uh, one thing I also noticed, did you, did you notice the Australian polls, the female polls, were mm -hmm. way better than the French female polls, something unique to this tournament that they... Uh, when there are four women on the field or whichever gender has the most, they're going to force that gender to pull, right? I think that's one of the most fascinating things, and I think we saw it come out here. Was your favorite moment of the half the lefty huck from Quentin Roger? It, it felt fantastic. We just saw that highlight. This guy, he, he's been playing with the disc every time he catches it. You don't know which way he's going to pivot. I'm not sure he knows which way, but when he sees those opportunities, he just steps out and throws the throw that he needs to throw. And if you want a little insight, when that last Australian goal was scored, Darrell was like, goodness, that worked? Can't believe that worked. <laughs> not exactly how you draw it up, but... Crunchy. <laughs> crunchy indeed. What, 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 what do you think about France's chances in the second half here, quickly? Well, they really need to work on their end zone. As the half progressed, their offense down in the red zone started to stymie. Australia really clamped on the pressure, and they didn't keep their players spread enough and then forced two turnovers, so they've got to work on their end zone. Yeah. Find a way to bracket that uh, Australia attack. They're cutting from the back, and they're cutting underneath that way, and the, the deep cuts are second and coming from the front. I feel like you could bracket that, and that could be a really good way to slow that down, similar to what Australia is doing to them. The Aussie Crocs, two-time silver medalist, set the World Games with a 7-5 lead at halftime over the French, who are making their World Games debut. Tom Stiles, Rahel Toshnerova have the call of the second half from the Olympic Channel Studios in Madrid after this quick break. Last 50 years have seen a lot of positive change around a whole range of important issues and some things remain reassuringly unchanged like the spirit of our game ultimate is 50 years young and still a perfect circle of fair play athletic pursuit and camaraderie in fact ultimate was a social network before social networks even existed Respetamos nuestras diferencias and understand the value that they add. The revolution of the disc in flight continues to prove that there's nothing we can't achieve when we pull together. Australia seven, France five. So we're back in the second half here. Australia starting and starting quickly with Alex Shepard across to Rob Andrews on the far, on this near side. And uh, Georgia Egan Griffiths. Australia winning that first half. And uh, now, in the second half, they're quickly making an error and giving it to France. France needing a couple of breaks to get back into this game. But that is a, a good way to start, getting the disc off them. Lapagnol flicks across to the far side. A big bid goes up, and there's an unmarked player now. He's got plenty of time. Resets to the centre. Australia looked exposed for a minute now, cutting up the line. Oh, that is beautiful cutting. 
just explosive power through the legs. Gail Arcelana, captain's effort up the line. Australia made to pay for that effort. It's 7-6 uh, the score as uh, France score. Arcelana's speed up the line. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> Excellent captain's effort. We saw his calmness. We, we were... I could literally see him thinking, where am I going to be the most dangerous? Here is where the experience really shows. And this 31-year-old is proving so useful for this French team. We've just been thinking and talking about during halftime that there won't be too many opportunities. Australia will give France to get their breaks break back. And <laughs> straight out of half, they get one. And Ancelan just puts one on the point. He's, we see him, look how happy he is to be there. But to be fair, the French D-line have only had the disc twice, and both times they've scored it. So their perfect conversion rate is 100%, which is, which is amazing. But they haven't had the disc enough, whereas the, the Aussies have had the disc a lot. Uh, they, <laughs> they've had um, break opportunities. They've had uh, three break opportunities. So we'll... Uh, We'll come back to that, but the, the score is 7-6. And speaking of women's polls, look at that poll from Borneau. That was excellent. That was almost to the end zone line. Giving the Aussies a full field to work with. Chulet in the middle. Yeah, Kat Phillips again cutting out of that deep space. You'll see her just do that again and again, lurking dangerously deep and then cutting all the way back. She's got the stamina from uh, hours and hours and hours of running and, and fitness work that she does. This is nice from Australians. Prentice lurking in the middle. Kyle O oh with the disc now. Comes back to Tula. He'll just keep running. Oh, big pressure. And uh, is there going to be a conversation? No, there isn't. Sullivan Roble with a uh, diving touch of the fingertips. This is, this is a big moment. The French could be back on even terms here. We saw a few contested grabs in those last um, Australian possessions. And now they finally get one in. And it's going to be a break for the French. Excellent layout save. Number 71, Sullivan Roblet with double happiness. Double happiness getting the touch of Tom Tulit. The Australians, who looked really, really strong coming into the half, have now been broken twice in the second half. The French are sticking around. They are going to be determined. And it's through their own hard work and their pressure that they've made this pay. That That's a pass to, uh, to Chula in the middle of the field. Looked safe as. But with Sullivan Roble making absolutely certain. No, if you're going to leave anything loose, the French are going to take it down and they're going to convert. He has got a block. He's got an assist. And he's got, an, he's got a score. And his dad and grandmother watching at home are just so proud. <laughs> so proud. It's uh, action-packed here. Well, if you thought this World Games tournament was going to be a one-sided affair in any way whatsoever, you thought it was going to be predictable in any way whatsoever, then I think you need to rethink your expectations. Look at the balance on that disc as it flies into the end zone. Roble absolutely flat out, unable to contain it as he has to go to ground after the catch. And uh, the French, four women on the field, and it's a big pull from Berthe. And I think she got a little bit too much inside edge on that. No breeze to blame. The, uh, it was, the Australian women's pulling was, was really strong in the first half. French uh, need to find that similar strength. Mondio has got a, a great pull, but I think she's not going to be playing a lot of defensive points, is she? Uh, she... Yeah, not sure. Well, Maybe she they're. Is, she is playing she a is defensive playing, play. Yeah. Well, why is she? Why isn't she pulling? That's strange. Anyway, Berthe uh, throwing it out of bounds. The Aussie starting at the brick mark. Well, oh, nice little flick to him. Quick set of feet, sprinting downfield. Karoma coming across. Nice work. Phillips now. Aussies looking really composed, but a big poach there. And the, the uh, poach works. It makes that throw go across the field. Georgia Egan Griffiths reaching all the time. It was a great breakside option. 
the space was there, but the throw just having a bit too much spin on it, went a bit too quickly. La Pagnol with a chance now for France. Spins it across to this near side, Antoine floats into the end zone, the French have done it! And they have the lead for the first time since the opening point of the game. They have been incredible in the second half. Uh, Eva, yeah, Eva Bourneau, second goal. She's had a huge block at the start of the game to keep the French in the game. And it seems like Ancelan, the captain, is signaling a timeout. I would be guessing, and that's the only time I'm going to take a guess here on the co in the commentary booth, is that it is the Australian team who will take the timeout to sort of recollect themselves after this incredible start of second half for the French, who have scored three breaks in a row. I, no, I think it is. I think it's the French. I thought that uh, that was um, that was the captain Ancelin signalling the, the the timeout, which which I honestly I don't understand. They had the momentum there. They they are absolutely riding high. Aussies are up against the wall and looking in bits in the second half. Why would you not just keep the ro the ball rolling? Could be that they might have found an answer to some of the plays that the that Australia is implementing, which would mean that it's good to spread this knowledge among the entire squad and just keep doing that and, you know, focus on that even more, do it even better. But like we said, lots of mental toughness. Here is um, Rogaki, the head coach, really pumping her team up, reminding them of what they've been working on throughout this preparation. They've had loads and loads. They've been, they've been playing together for almost a year now. So many training camps, so many bonding activities, several preparations ga preparation games, including one against Germany, I believe. And they've been traveling around the, uh, the USA with games in rally and Atlanta, just to get you know high level competition uh, in the USA in the heat bonding as a group and uh, Anna Regaki the the coach really stressed the fact that you know, Australia is a huge country really geographically dispersed team so they've done an awful lot of their preparation their mental preparation online they've done it through you know, you know online video conferencing calls um, but that's, that team bond is going to be pulled into far, sharp focus now. Can they show the resilience to recover from this in incredible start to second half from France? They trail 8-7 after three French breaks, and the O-line have got some work to do to prove themselves now. On the far sideline. Bringing it back to the middle now. That was a... Clever disc to expose that space. Shepard opening up the break side. Prentice now spins it across to Shepard again. The two Alexes connecting well. Downfield, it's floated beautifully into Sam McGuckin for his fourth point of the game. Cheers, but that is the start of what the uh, Aussies need to do. They need to clean up their offence. That's the first point the offence have scored in four. They'll be pleased to, to, to do it with half an hour left on the clock. This game to 13 or game to eight, it's an 80-minute game. But the, uh, the Aussies looking a little bit more content there, Raquel. Impressive stuff from McGuckin, adding another stat to his impressive record for this game. We've been talking about how hot it is on the pitch, but what we should actually mention is the humidity because you literally see the water condensating and dripping off of these players' skin and jerseys, really. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is hot. It's, we're 27 degrees, 82 Fahrenheit uh, out there in, uh, in Alabama. Water very much uh, in need for both of these teams as the uh, Aussie is going to spin a big pull down is it going to stay in bounds it's drifting towards that sideline oh it lands just in bounds and it's gone out the side so we'll bring it to the I think it will be the brick mark I think it might have landed exactly on Did the it line landed on the okay it landed on the line so the line the line is out and it's going to be brought to the brick mark by Rob Lay. 26-year-old out of Nantes, 
place for UFO and Chuck. See this overhead shot. See the players moving the tactics of the two teams in uh, like a chessboard, but with a flying disc separating the pieces. It's a floaty disc. It's jumped in. Excellent work from the French. Celine Antoine with the goal, but it was a team point. They made light work slicing through the Australian zone. And Raquel, this is looking good for the French right here. She has enjoyed that last jump into the end zone so much. She is one of the oldest players on the team, 35 years of age, out of um, Strasbourg. She plays for Seskidiscus, which is also the club team for the captain Ancelan. And in a little pre-Worlds interview, we were given a little fun fact about her that she is the one who hits the gym the most. So great to see her put it into good use on the field. We'll see on the replay once more. Roger, who can throw with both hands. So it, he, he's happy to throw that. And that time is using the lefty. He can throw flicks and backhands with, with, on both sides. So it's an absolute nightmare to mark. He's been throwing. He's been throwing, Tom. Three, um, three assists, two goals himself. He's having a great game. Well, this is exciting. The European teams... Stepping into the world stage in a grand manner. Absolutely right. The Great Britain, France and Germany, the three European sides here. Perhaps not the favoured teams, but France making a great case for themselves being... Um, uh, you know, underrated coming into this game. Now Australia, oh, that is beautiful. Just before we even got to the commentary, Egan Griffiths poking it into the end zone, picked up beautifully by Liv Carr. They made it look easy, and that's uh, what they need to do. The last four points have actually been uh, zero turnover points, really clean. In fact, there's only been three, tur three turnovers in this second half and they all went the way of France and they converted all three. So really high quality ultimate and the scoreboard is racing up nine all. And as we see the French involve their women a little bit more in their offensive points, we see an almost exclusively female point out of the Australians, the ellipsis connection with the nice finish to Carr. That's kind of what we were expecting from the start of the game. A really strong showing out of these Australian women. Anna Rogaki with last second instructions to the Australians. Now really start having to start focusing on the defense. We're tied at nine. Still a bit time to go, but I don't think the French will want to give it up easily at this point of the game. Well, yeah, this is critical moments. Nine each. Both sides have proven their ability to break the other team. Both sides have proven really nice flowing offense when they've given an opportunity. This is about the mistakes. It's about the pressure they can build. And that disc landing on the line. Those pulls we saw from the Australians in the first half at the back of the end zone were looking really, really good. That wasn't good from... Caro Mark gives the French the opportunity to bring it into the centre of the field, what we call the brick mark. You see the advantage that gives them. An extra 15 metres up the field, two fakes, and then a reset pass, dumping it back. Roger, Quentin Roger, floats it out to the far side, back into the middle now, and Roger continues with the disc, and a pick is called. And signals from the players. Ultimate entirely self-refereed. The players using had signals to let the fans in the stands and each other know what's happened. So the timing of the pit call is the only contentious thing here, whether the disc needs to go yeah. back. And then there was more continued play. Does it have to come back here or does it go there? Uh, did it affect the play? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, so, so... How many passes does the play continue for? Well, uh, that's up to you. But, but yeah. the farther it goes on, but the more likely... Uh, the farther it goes, the more likely it affected. Yeah, if I'll find that it's where it is. Okay, we'll start there. Uh, game, game advisor Wally Kwong. So here we see a great display of spirit of the game, one of the key aspects of Ultimate Frisbee, or the flying disc as we call it, here at the World Games. Players really taking responsibility for their decisions on the field, having to agree on the outcome of each call. I think a true display of the values that the World Games or any international big sporting events are trying to convey. 
not just to the players, but to the spectators as well. Nice movement from the French here, but the, the, the Australian defence is really um, slowing them down, making them take the passes. Roger again. That floaty pass. Oh, and it's just a little bit too far ahead. A mistake from the French offence, the first mistake of the second half. They've been flawless in the second half and created a lot of pressure. Well, Australians have stuck around. They've been persistent. They've uh, not been upset. Ladamatos with the disc now. Resets it to the middle. Kyle O to the far side. Big flick across the field. French Robley thinking about making another huge bid. Doesn't. Floats it back. Asks the question. Australians coming up with the answers. Good, sh good shot calling his teammates a bit closer. They've been trying to spread it wide, but now they decide to go for the big floaty hook. Sally Yu underneath this. Going to be pressure from the French, and it's the pressure from the French that counts. A huge point-saving bid from Pauline Berthe. And she's excited about this, and I am excited with her. I have had the chance to meet Berthe last year at a training camp for the youth, and I know that she has worked really hard on herself, and the pressure of the of these young women coming into a huge huge tournament like this you can see that this is what gets them pumped up just sticking with it point by point game by game excellent stuff out of the french well it's such a short tournament it's five days five games that's all you get so every single game every single moment of every single game counts and that might be the difference between this point being scored as the french continue now they do not want to give up. And Bertet just showing a brilliant example of how determined the French are to stay with the Australians in this game. Nine each. This Paul B starter has, has been brilliant to watch. We stay with the action now down on field. Continuing with Roger, who almost throws everything he got at that one and eventually does. Big reaching disc and it's Robley underneath it. And the Australians... Uh, they took the disc off the French, but the French have stuck around. They got that block back in the end zone and they've put it in. And that is just persistence personified from the French team there. Despite the poaching in the open lane by the Australians, the French just waste no time and take that big round shot around that curves over both of the Australian defenders into the break side. Here's that block again. Wonderful effort. And then she even manages to land right in front of the intended receiver to prevent her trying to get a second chance on that. Here's that shot. Thinks Forced about it twice. Yeah. Thinks about it twice. He, the, the defense was doing exactly the right thing by hanging in that space, but Robles got the skill to get it over the defense. And if you are hanging back, then the uh, deep receiver is available. You see Robles in our shot and uh, Quentin Roger. Uh, to the left there, sitting down. Pumped up the French are at the moment. The, the game is basically on serve, but because the uh, French started with the disc and the, the players taking the opportunity to get water on as we're in another heat timeout. I believe they do take every opportunity to get out of the di di direct sun. Uh, find a little bit of shade here as the French coaching contingent sort of discussing what the last part of the game is going to look like for the French. I believe they have come out with a little bit more energy in the second half. I think the first half was sort of, like I said, teams trying to find out what this is going to, what the competition is going to be like, how everything is going to turn out in these real conditions, you know, finally being in Birmingham, finally being on the pitch after months and months of preparation, making it through COVID, making it through the different distances that they had to travel. Here is a bit of French fandom. And like I said, so not too much happening in the first half. A few breaks out of both teams. Well, actually a bit more on the Australian side. And then the French really coming out hot and steaming to the second half. But like I said, this is not the end. And we have seen some great stuff out of the Australians previously. So all we need is just that extra step on the gas for them to take this maybe to universe. It's, it's the closest game 
that the tournament has uh, produced so far. The temperature rising both on and off the field. The Birmingham in Alabama, the World Games, and this Pool B matchup between Australia and France could not be closer. The French the are one point up in this game so far. They're coming out on defence now. Four men on the field. It's mixed ultimate. Four men for two points and then four women for the next two points. Teams are changing ends every point. France in the white and uh, Australia in the green and gold. Both Borno sisters on the line for the French. Ancelan, the captain. McGuckin for the Australians. Saw Cat Phillips earlier right next to him. Maybe worth mentioning that she's played in the Australian Football League ever since the competition started five years ago in the women's category. Her club currently third in the country. So the, 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 the clock on the, on the screen, it has been stopped. That's just to um, restop the clock for the heat timeout. So just making sure that's back in line. Australia. A little bit of sagging off on the handlers by the French. Very deep uh, stack. Very sharp disc there from Kyle O. Sorry, it was Alex Gann and another disc from Gann now. Over onto that far side. Resets back to Cupcake. Tom Tulip. Inside shot to Cat Phillips again, just coming out of that deep space. Always available. Looking for the down-the-line pass, but the big, determined defensive effort prevents the pass going. This is the sort of determination that the French have shown throughout this game, and it's working. Floaty pass across. Shepard keeps the toes in line. And it's too easy in the end. A great cut from Georgia Egan Griffiths for a point to go with her assist from earlier. They've levelled it up, and they've done so cleanly. They've been asked some difficult questions by the French here, though, Krakel. So calm and collected, though, by the Australians, this offensive point. It almost looks boring because they just look downfield. If there's nothing there, they take it around. Big swings, really changing the angle of attack. And so calm and so steady in front of the end zone. We see him turn his shoulders. And here's the up blind cut. Little G making a big hold for Australia. Alex Prentice there alongside the three shirts of Kyle O. Prentice, a doctor, one of the several doctors on this Australian team. It's known for being able to keep her white clothes white. Yes, I'm going to be supplying you with random fun facts just to make these incredible athletes a little bit more human while you watch them perform in this excruciating heat and humidity. They are people after all. The Australians, it, like, we can't underestimate how much of a, a big upset this would be if the, French, if the French take this game. You know, I think they're twice runners-up, fourth place last time round. They've won the bronze medal as well. They are... A, oh, and... If the turnover straight off the first pass, Australians coming out in a zone and... There was a player open, but that pass was just a bit too shy. Now Australia with an important chance to get that break back. Caro Ma. Short pass to Shepard. Into the end zone. Oh, it's too easy. And the uh, Aussies, are their first impact of the second half, they've finally managed to get the disc off the French. And they've put it in this time. And that's 11-10. Yeah, well, I didn't get a chance to finish my point about how much of a big upset it would be if the Australians uh, didn't, didn't win this game, but we might not need you to. You might not need to, we exactly, need to exactly. It. So the French, what an excellent tactical move by Australia. They, a lot of teams being in a position that Australia is in would just stick with kind of what is the easiest thing for defense to do, which is try to stick to really close, tight match D. But it hasn't been bearing its fruit so far for Australia. So really changing that rhythm with the zone, calming, soothing the French into being just really chill. We see that 
Mondio saw the open pass, saw the open space, but just an errant throw really in the last third and then a very aggressive, almost daring, but also very easy <laughs> score for the Australians. There is no wind out here. Mish Phillips now for the pull, but that, you know, that's a collector's item there. Uh, uh, Mondio unforced error to the ground. She doesn't turf many discs and uh, it might be costly for the French now. Spins it across into the hands of Bono and on the far sideline here is Poat Sokolski. French women now getting a lot more heavily involved on the handler side of things. Antoine and a mistake from the French. The pressure telling from, oh no, run through block for the French again, maybe a little bit too casual. That pass never looked on. Too much company there and French let off the hook. There's going to be a deep shot into the end zone. A big bid comes up, but it's in French hands. They've leveled it up again at 11 apiece. Poat Sokolski keeping a chilly head under an incredible bid. Wow, what a game. I can't believe we're only two points away from the hard cap. This is absolutely unexpected. Uh, we, of course, had no idea what these teams were going to look like. I was more confused than anyone because I'm, I'm usually not very good at predicting and I, I try to shy away from it when I can. But I definitely did not expect this game to be this tight. But now I'm even more interested who's going to come up on top. Yes. A game to 13 in this opening Pool B match. Just uh, three pool games and then you're straight into semis and finals. One game a day for these teams. And in this opening day of the tournament at the World Games, these teams coming off 18 months of preparation. We see that disc from Roble rise a little bit too high. That was the mistake. But the redemption from Australia came just as quickly. Let's have a look at this now. I didn't get to see the uh, redemption, but there's that big bid trying to keep the disc in Australian hands or get the disc back in Australian hands. But the French... There. It was it was Antoine with the block. I remember. I've seen it. She's done a great job uh, remedying her, her error uh, and getting the disc right back. Juliet now cuts up the line. And there's Phillips. Back to Chile. Sends the disc cross, really using the full width of the field. There was a cutter going deep there, but uh, the, the French have let that go. Maybe a deep switch. Definitely some switching going on downfield on the female side of uh, female on the female side for the French. Oh, what a throw from the lying position out of the Australians. Was that Chulet who slid in front of the end zone? Tom Chulet. Goes to the ground with a, a, a hero maker of a pass, but has the presence of mind to see the Australian Rob Andrews running into the end zone. So his fourth point of the game, Tulip's third assist of the game, make it absolutely sure. Probably a little bit gratuitous that layout, but never mind. He'll uh, we'll chalk that one up to a, a brilliant piece of highlight action. For those of you that this is for for those of you who are watching Ultimate Frisbee or the Flying Disc for the first time, this is not a very common occurrence. We do not throw the disc from the ground, but some of us just can. Look at that. He was gonna he was gonna slide all the way into the end zone. That didn't work out, so he just put a little dish in. So this is it. Game point to Australia. It's game to thirteen. Can they close this one out? They're coming out on D. The, the, the French need to score this offensive point. They're going to have the disc in their hands at the start of the point. They need to put it in, and then they need to come back out, take the disc off the Australians, and prevent them from scoring. Big moments here in this opening Pool B game. The French have pushed the Australians extremely hard, but right now, the Aussies have got it. And I think they will try to close this game quickly. Can they get the disc off the French? And it's a risky first pass. Big pressure from the Aussies. Crossfield. Quentin Roger. Contact made and apology comes quickly. Alex Gann apologising. He got stepped on. It will be uncontested and the players will assume 
their original position, the open hands, palms up, signaling the no contest. Roger just flicks it across the field. Capel. That's a disc around, but Phillips is there. Phillips has grabbed it. Australia with a chance to take the game. Dish, quick dish back. Oh, and it's uh, just a basic receiving error. Two hands. Alex Gann and Roger does, wastes no time. Jacks it deep. Pressure underneath this from the Australians. Two players rising. Contact made. There's going to be a foul call here. Sullivan Robley up in the air. Caught in the air by Alex Ladomatos. The disc was hanging. And then maybe it went out of bounds. Sorry, I'll stand up. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. Do you need a translator or? Yeah. Okay. So what you're saying is that you have this position, it jumps straight, and then like you, you can't came like behind. Me. Yeah, that's what you think. Yeah, I think that uh, I was making a straight line. I, was, I mean, I'd like to say replay, but I felt like I was going straight, and that I got a good jump in my okay. space. Okay. You, you understood that? He said that he thinks he goes straight. They're still doing. After this translation, let me go. Okay, they're looking at the replay now. Okay, it's it's come up to 45 seconds, so you know you need to come to a resolution. We can hurry that up. You have to come to a conclusion. Yeah, it's been 45 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's a contested file. So the game advisor just walking us through that one. Disagreement between the players. Some of their teammates were watching the video replay, which they're uh, entitled to do, part of the information gathering. I think, from our point of view, watching that back, Raquel, hard to see, but, but easy to Very see. Hard. Yeah, bo not, both points of view. Mm -hmm, were yeah, exactly. There. Not a great angle. I believe uh, the short time limits for the discussions are a bit too harsh on uh, games like this where you might need a translation but nonetheless these are the rules of the games everyone knows it the disc just goes back it is a fair outcome so it stays with the French disc going downfield now the second time around it's a complete repeat only this time the Australians aren't close enough the French have leveled it up and we have our first universe point game incredible work from the French Closing that one out, self-refereeing there. It, it, the, what I was really impressed by was both teams, both players, keeping their cool, stating their point. Their points differed. The rules allow there for to be a disagreement, and there's still an outcome. So the disc goes back. Uh, both players happy with that. Let's have a look at the replay again. Is that grab from Phillips taking it away from Eline Mondio? And Alex Gann is going to have to question what was going through his head there because that was the simplest of grabs. But here's that uh, big disc downfield. Roger sends it. And Seems like he loses sight of the disc immediately after uh, after the contact is there. And it's so difficult to say whether that disc, whether he would have had a second chance on that disc or if it was already out of bounds. Nonetheless, it does not matter because the players have had a chance to say yeah. their point of view. There, there has been a resolution. And like we said, spirit of the game, a true representation of the values that might have Maybe. gone missing in the meantime from us from a few sports. Maybe, maybe there was no right right call there because I, I, we've just watched the replay there and I think I come to a different conclusion. I, I think Robley was in the air and he was knocked off the path from the contact. So it just, you know, the right, the right course of action there was the disc went back. The French have scored it and we are in Sunday 12 all. This pool, uh, pool B matchup, Australia and France. Both of these teams coming into this game uh, with high hopes but probably the Australians with higher expectations and the French have fought hard both teams have traded a lot of breaks we've had four breaks go either way but we've ended up here the Australians are going to start with the disc where are they going to start with the disc we've seen some strong pulls from France we've seen some loose ones as well right now they need the best pull going stick it in the back of the end zone and let the Australians struggle from there the heat in Birmingham, in Alabama, for World Games. 
as things are heating up. You couldn't ask for a more steady offense out of the Australian team. Sam McGuckin, Prentice, Cat Phillips, Tulit, all of these big star names set us off for the universe point. Australia, Tulit breaks across to that far side, sticks it downfield, McGuckin. Back to Tulit again. Power and commitment to the cut. Downfield, no contact made. Shepard back to Tulip. Steady from the Australians. They can't afford a mistake here. Pressure from the French. Flurrying around every disc. Going backwards now with Tulip. Resetting again across that far side. Nothing special about the offence yet. It's steady. French defence forcing a lot of passes out of the Australians. It's Rob Andrews now, down the line, close to the line. McGuckin continues the Australian possession. They're close to it now. Cupcake flows down the line. There's been a pick called. It will come back. Rob Andrews uh, sees that everybody stopped. It looked a little bit too free. I think Australia are really getting into the red zone right now. The French, off, uh, the French defense will have less and less room for switches and poaches and it will really come down to full match defense. Ancelan guarding Toulet, a great matchup to watch. We see Borno poaching off the open side. Complete replay of the point, and Australia have won it. Toulet down the line to Andrews. No pick call this time. Andrew, oh, I apologize. Maybe there is a pick call. There's a call on the field. The way Andrew celebrated with the Australian team there, that's... And uh, was it... What's the, the... What is the call? Can we have a hand signal, players? So Looks like a pick call. Looks like another pick. Coming in at three. A violation. Violation. Somebody moving before the disc was tapped in. Regardless, great defensive effort on the last pass. Somebody from the French team just flying through. Tulip being forced back around. Phillips there. On oh, a touch from Waroger, but it comes up still in Australian hands. They dish it in. Oh, that summarises the entire game. French determination, but just not quite enough. Australia winning this opening game. The Aussie Crocs celebrate. They've beaten the French 13-12 in what has got to go down as the most brilliant opening game in this uh, Pool B for in the World Games uh, history. I just, I've loved everything about that. Raquel, just wrap it up for us. What have we seen here? Honestly, no need for the French to be disappointed. I think they've put up an excellent performance for their first appearance in the World Games at this international stage. Look at Roger just getting a hand on that. He was trying to grab that. You could tell that he was trying to catch his Ds. But here, a little last lucky catch, but honestly, happy go lucky. Um, the Aussies really putting lots of pressure, lots of energy in those last few points. They didn't start the second half as well with uh, France getting three breaks on them, but then they pushed through when it was necessary and hopefully that will show the entire community and other athletes as well how important this mental preparation is because it could be what made the difference after all. Nonetheless, excellent performance out of the French they have had some wonderful moments. Great to see the newer, younger or less experienced players make their first mark on the world stage, really not having any respect towards these veterans. It's a brilliant game to watch. The two other teams in this uh, pool is Japan and Colombia. They are going to be taking note of everything they've seen out here as we see some highlights of the game. France and Australia. Brilliant opener for both of them. But the presence of mind of Georgia Egan Griffiths with that final grab on the line. Big plays from the French throughout. Big pressure throughout. They came out in the second half determined to really make a game of it, and they absolutely did. But in the end, the Australians were just too good.
in every moment throughout the game. There we go. Georgia Even Griffiths puts it in. Australia 13 and France 12. All right, Australia by one over France. What a game to cap the opening day session on day number one here at the Flying Disc Competition. We welcome you back to Birmingham, Alabama with Daryl Stanley and Megan Tormey. I am Evan Leffler, and wow, a heart stopper, a 3 nothing run from France to Storm out of the gates in the second half after they trailed 7-5. The Aussies got one break back, and that was intense down the stretch. Both games have ended with a kind of a fluky deflection. Remember, the <laughs> Germans won on a deflected disc, and Georgia Egan Griffiths hanging on after Kenton Roger could not catch the D, just got a tiny piece of it. And, Megan, the Aussies survive your thoughts so this is exactly the kind of game that i expect to see at the world games you take some of the best coaches in a country the best players in a country and you pit them against one another and you just watch them continuously make adjustments the players are so smart so capable of coming out with slightly different looks and and each team thought they had an advantage but watch that advantage dwindle when the other team started to make adjustments so this kind of back and forth on the edge of your seat the entire time exactly what i was looking forward to at the World Games. Wow. I, yes. Like, that was that chess match that we were looking for. Um, so, France started off playing a bit more zonal, right? Poaching the back of the stack cuts. Really smart. Uh, but you saw Australia just make those adjustments. They changed the shape of their cuts. They said, oh, you're going to guard that? Well, we'll clear out the front of the stack now and have that cutter that you were backing come underneath and uh, slide across the front of the stack. I, I just saw so many adjustments like that throughout the game. Brilliant coaching on both sides. It was a lot of fun being next to Daryl Stanley, listening to him comment on all the little micro coaching adjustments. As we check oh. out the highlights, the French gave it everything they had. Just played with so much ferocity and intensity. Oh. I mean, like every, every, I, I really noticed how quickly and how hard they were running coming out of the break. Um, Francis came out looking like they had just gotten like pickle juice or something to get themselves, you know, <laughs> feeling this heat was nothing. No, but you're absolutely right. Every throw was tightly Every contested. Every lefty backhand from yes, Kenton Roger. Roger was absolutely phenomenal. Watching him was such a amazing. joy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a showman, right? So this was the go-ahead score, giving France the 8-7 lead. Oh, this, I thought this was going to be the play of the game right here. This block, this is at 11-12, uh, I want to say. No, no, it was 10-11. France was on O, and they were about to get broken, and that block um, by Berthe Day was incredible to save that. The break for the Aussies at 11-10. Shepard to Andrews regain the lead for the Crocs. Goodness, were Shepard and Andrews good today for the Crocs? Oh, I, I mean, Andrews, you, you tallied up his goals. What? Four goals, three assists. And that was just maybe in the second half, right? No, that was the whole game. But, oh. <laughs> oh, it <laughs> but it felt, felt like it. Like it, it felt incredible. like it. Yeah, he uh, was wow. a dominant, just a dominant performance from Andrew. Constantly open. Um, really great chemistry, clearly, with Shepard, but just doing a great this, job of... Uh, this call was critical, too. Yeah. Um, great spirit by both sides. I, I was, like, getting really close to that conversation just to... We had translations happening. We had, like, spirit happening. We looked at the replay. It was the whole gamut of, like, how to do conflict resolution in the, the, the right way. And the deflection from Roger, but he knew he just didn't get enough of it. Egan Griffiths, the dish to Shepard for the game. And, and one of those games where the teams had identical number of turnovers, only 10 turnovers apiece. Each team scored more than they turned it. Four breaks aside... 
Aussies, before, Aussies yeah. received the opening pull at the start of the game, and you know that that half break, if you want to call it that, might have been the difference. I think France is going to really look at themselves and be a little bit disappointed because they they got those three breaks coming out of the half right away yeah. to get themselves you know back up and and in that driver's seat to just be able to hold out for the win. Um, so you know, heartbreaking for them for sure. So the French in their first ever appearance at the World Games earn a ton of respect but ultimately fall short and Megan look they, they were bigger underdogs than one they they covered the so-called spread I don't know if you can actually make some book on it anywhere in the world you, you should uh, how do you think the French are feeling right now the the balance between we showed well but moral victories are not what the World Games are necessarily about I don't know. My hope for them is that they walk away with a lot of pride in this game. They, you know, the ability to come out on this stage and put on the performance they did, make the adjustments in the moment, that is so difficult to do. And it just speaks volumes to the preparation they put in, the talent that they brought to this tournament, um, and, and what the rest of the tournament could hold for them. I mean, it's just, it, overall, it bodes really, really well for the French program. I mean, that's a very tough pool. Uh, that yeah. they've got. I mean, but if you can show like that against uh, Colombia on the third day or, or Japan, I mean, you know, that's that's they played really well. Um, I'm excited for that French team, and they brought a lot of coaches too. So uh, I'm not surprised that they uh, that you felt like their coaching was uh, was on point there. Australia will take on Japan in game number two of the tournament to get day two started. That's a 9:30 a.m. game. Yeah. Meanwhile, this French team has a lot of time to to dwell and reflect and prepare to face Colombia in the nightcap tomorrow, the 6 o'clock Central Time p.m. game tomorrow evening. We're going to take a very brief timeout and then welcome in Tom Chulip from Team Australia after the Aussies survive 13-12 over France. Tom Chulip coming up here in our postgame coverage from Birmingham. where everyone is welcome regardless of age shape skin color or anything else that tries to box people in a place where we defy the odds defy the naysayers and even defy gravity a place where it's accepted that success doesn't belong to the faint-hearted it belongs to the brave to the determined a place that knows grit knows grace, knows bright lights, and knows empty bleachers. A place where we remember to laugh. Where we learn to trust. Learn to high-five strangers. And eventually, even learn to fly. A place where character, community, and competition are all as balanced as a disc in flight. That place isn't in a stadium or on a field. That place is in the spirit of our players. Because we don't just play ultimate, we live ultimate. Welcome back, everybody. We are joined by one of the leaders of Team Australia, Tom Chulet, 13-12 over France. I imagine you expected to win. I'm not sure you expected to be quite like that. What were your thoughts on your 2022 World Games debut? Uh, it was a great game. Um, I guess we don't come into any game expecting anything. We try and just come in with, with a clean slate um, and try and just focus on ourselves um, and just play the best frisbee that we can do. So yeah, we didn't come in expecting to win. Um, it was probably a closer game than what we'd like to uh, close games out, especially after getting up a couple of breaks in the uh, first half there, but um, we're great. Uh, we're really happy that the 
the team sort of maintain their positive mindset and just ground that game out. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that mental preparation? I heard um, your coach, uh, Anna Ragaki, mm. you know, really focus in on that. And, and I found that very unique in, in some of your preparation. Could you share with, with the, the viewers? Yeah, so Anna has a, a, a mental fitness program that we, we started 12 months ago. Um, it's a range of things from uh, imagery, meditation, um, goal setting, value setting, legacy setting on the individual level, um, but then also some discomfort challenges like cold water immersion um, and all of that. So we've been really focused on it and we've started to incorporate some of that into our warm-up routine with some attention training um, and also each evening we'll do a meditation and an imagery session together and it's just a good way for us to so, sort of connect and make sure that we're leveled. It's really, really good. And how much do you feel like you individually or the team leaned on that coming into the second half when France opened up with three breaks and took away the comfortable lead that you had? Um, hard to say for sure, but I'm, I'm sure it sort of like propped us up a little bit. Um, I guess we wouldn't want to find out if we didn't, if we didn't have it in our, our, up our sleeve. So we're just happy it's there. Certainly you maintain your composure when they went on that 3-0 run. What was the conversation like? They took a timeout. Did they take the timeout or did you take the timeout after they had scored three straight? We took that timeout. That, that's sure. what I thought. So yeah. you guys took the timeout. What was the conversation like in that huddle? It did stabilize things and you got the break at 10 all. That put you in position to win. Yep. Uh, it was just a check-in for us. Um, I didn't think anything was structurally wrong. Um, we were just making some unforced errors. So um, we just reminded the offense line that if we just kept kept running and kept making our cuts um, and kept throwing the chest in space that it would come. And for the D-line, it was all about just shortening up the stack a little bit and keep presenting, um, especially if we're running and gunning on the offensive turn there. We've seen Andrews make plays for a number of years for Team Australia. He hasn't gotten slower uh, in the five years since the World Games have uh, passed. As we look at the highlights from the game, what can you say about uh, some of the performances from your teammates that you see on the screen? Well, I see mostly just Tom in these highlights. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh -huh. Rob, Rob, Rob's only getting better, um, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but every, everyone is really impressed. Um, it, is, it is quite a new team, and we're super excited to sort of see how players step up here. But um, just seeing, like, there was a massive layout block by Sally Yu. Um, oh, Rob's playing yeah, well. Cool. Shep. Gan also have heaps of speed and the throwing power across the board, especially on the female side with Prentice, Egan Griffiths, Phillips and, and Ma, it looks really, really good there. So You could tell. I mean, their pull quality when, you're, uh, when your female players are pulling, like it was unbelievable um, and, and a notable difference between the French side. Do you think that that is something that will continue as you face teams that are notable for their, for their women like Japan and Colombia? Yeah, we'll back our women in all tournament. Um, we think they're some of the best players in the world um, and they can match up against the best players in the world or from other countries as well. Um, and we expect them to lead us to this tournament. So later today, we'll get a first look at the other two teams in your pool, Colombia and Japan. What, what are your thoughts about those two teams that you'll see over the next uh, 48 hours or so? Um, they're both exciting countries to play against. They play very different brands of Frisbee, right. but in some way quite similar as well. Um, scouting both teams is quite hard because there's not a lot of footage, um, but we've got a bunch of players who have played against them a lot, and also Mish Phillips um, has played with Revo in Colombia um, and also with Japanese club teams as well. Um, so she can feed us a lot of information there. But I guess coming into the back end of the tournament, there's going to be a little bit of film available from today and then tomorrow's game as well. So we'll sit down each night, look at that, and uh, sort of formulate a plan for each game and just take it as it comes. How does this heat compare to the Sydney heat? <laughs> uh, right now, Sydney's about 15 degrees Celsius, so we're sitting at maybe 50 right. or 40. So coming across here, it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a shock, actually. Um, we were lucky enough to... Uh, touchdown at the start of July. We spent some time in North Carolina and Raleigh. Um, those folks helped us out there for a scrimmage and then we came across to Atlanta as well. So we put a big focus on heat acclimatization and making sure that we have prepared ourselves as best in this climate as we can and the best that our, our jobs and lives allow around Frisbee as well. So um, yeah, I think our bodies are making some really good adjustments there and our preparations pre-game and post-games are really sound. What do you learn most from this run of pre-tournament scrimmages that you had. Were there any major tweaks to anything that y'all were doing as a result of the preseason schedule almost for the World Games that you created? Um, we learnt a lot. I don't think they were major tweaks. They were just small things that we needed to adjust to make our major structures work better. Um, so we were really happy 
um, with how we played reviewing the film. I think in the moment in some of the games we, we were a little bit frustrated, um, especially immediately um, after them. But sitting down watching the film, we were able to see uh, the small changes that we were making. Um, each game was sort of being implemented by uh, the players individually and then the team as a whole. Um, and then I guess this is sort of coming together now and uh, we have complete faith and trust that all of that's going to click um, as we come into the World Games um, and we're just happy to be here and happy to see how it goes. It's so important to be able to hang on in a game like this one and learn from that process as you move forward in the, in the World Game. What's your takeaway from this game where you were able to hang on and notch a one-point victory? Um, I guess Anna outlined it, our head coach, um, she was she was like, we believed it was there, but now we know it's there. We know the mental strength is there, and we know that we can do anything against these teams. So it could have been very easy to um, go down that one break, and then when they got the three in a row, and sort of like just trade the game out, or like not feel very good and not play very good in the in the second half of the second half. Um, but I guess we take a lot of confidence knowing that we can stand up through that. We're, we're looking forward to it. All right, Tom. We, we are melting a little bit, and yeah. we've just been standing around <laughs> for four hours. So after playing a universe point game, we'll let you get to the shade. Congratulations Thank Thank on you. the thirteen twelve win. Look forward to seeing you in the Crocs tomorrow. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. That'll uh, wrap up our morning session coverage. Germany over Canada 13-5, and Australia defeats France 13-12. We'll be back about 15 minutes before 4 p.m. Central Time here in Birmingham for Colombia and Japan, and later tonight, USA, Great Britain. For Tom Chulet, Team Australia, Daryl Stanley, Megan Tormey, and our entire crew, Liam and Rahel in Madrid, I'm Evan Lepler saying so long for now. More World Games action to come later today here from Birmingham. Thank you for watching this exclusive World Flying Disc Federation coverage of the World Games. On behalf of our entire crew in Madrid and everyone here in Birmingham, Alabama, I'm Evan Leffler. This has been a copyrighted presentation of the International World Games Association in conjunction with the Olympic Channel and the World Flying Disc Federation.